always thought uh, the valor of the Secret Service, how they would literally, you know, throw themselves in front of a potential assassin's bullets, and always fascinated me. And the question to me was always, wait a minute, why didn't these agents do more to protect the man? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized there were a lot of anomalies, a lot of questions that needed to be answered on the subject. No one has spent more time studying the Secret Service's actions that day than Vince Palomera. Standard operating procedure in an open motorcade would have been for the agents to be running, walking, or jogging with the presidential limousine. And there was also two handrails in the back for an agent or agents to hold on to so they would be in close proximity to the president. Agents not riding on the rear of the limo is a huge issue in this case. The Secret Service agents are powerless to really do much of anything if they're not close to the president. And official mythology, I like to call it, is that President Kennedy allegedly ordered the agents off the car four days before Dallas. Claiming President Kennedy asked for changes to the motorcade's normal security protocols had been a recurring theme during the Warren Commission. I spoke to the special agent in charge of the White House detail, the number one agent, Gerald Bain. I asked him, President Kennedy, I understand, uh, he was difficult to pre protect, right? He didn't want the agents on the back of the car, and he told me, this is the exact quote, I don't remember Kennedy ever saying anything about not having agents on the back of the car. If you look at the newsreels, you'll see agents on there. Well, one by one, I spoke to many of his colleagues, not only in the Secret Service, but actually White House aides that were not Secret Service agents, and it was a landslide. They were all telling me the same thing. Supposedly, Kennedy ordered the agents on the back of what the agents. I don't know. Um, he had nothing to do with that. The record of history, that is wrong. President Kennedy, very nice man, not difficult to protect, did not order the agents off the back of the car. This complete departure from procedure is captured here as the motorcade begins to leave Love Field Airport in Dallas. Jogging beside the car was an agent in the fog car behind him, another agent rises from his seat and does hand gestures like this, obviously to order him to cease and desist. The agent stops his tracks three times, not once, not twice, but three times, goes like this. And actually that's the universal body language for what is going on. Turns out the agent's name was Don Lawton, and he's the agent who's formerly told to cease and desist by shift leader Emery Roberts who rises in his seat with the hand gestures and you see Don Lawton going like this. Don Lawton rode on the back of the car on the Chicago trip earlier in 1963 and four days before in Tampa. But he's relegated to meaningless love field luggage duty during the motorcade, uh, during the assassination. It's ridiculous. Secret Service agent Clint Hill is also recalled from his position on the opposite side of the limousine. Emery Roberts had been the only one of three Secret Service shift leaders from the White House that was part of the motorcade. Emery Roberts was in charge of a follow-up car that was immediately behind JFK, full of Secret Service agents. He was the general, so to speak, of the follow-up car. If he said something, that's how it went. Emery Roberts, however, received his orders from Floyd Boring, the number two man of the Secret Service White House detail based in Washington. Floyd Boring, he was in charge of planning the Texas trip, and he was the one who gave out assignments. In an interview with the Assassination Records Review Board in 1996, he stated that there had been no change in policy for the Dallas trip, and put the blame on President Kennedy. The number one man and head of the White House detail, Gerald Bain, was on vacation starting the week before the Texas trip which left the immediate handling of the trip to Boring. Floyd Boring's right-hand man in charge of the logistics on the ground in Texas was Special Agent Winston Lawson. Winston Lawson came from the Buffalo, Syracuse, New York area. He was a former counterintelligence agent in the Army, and he joined the Secret Service in 1959. And again, he was an advance agent, an agent that would actually go to the different cities in America and overseas in advance to uh, work with uh, the local police and dignitaries and whatnot to get everything in line with motorcade rides, building security, etc., etc. Lawson, assisted by agent Roger Warner, set the order of the vehicles in the Dallas motorcade. The normal order would have been to have a pilot car and a lead car, which was 
done in Dallas. Then you had a flatbed truck of the press photographers in front of the limousine filming and being eyewitnesses, and that in and of itself is a deterrent. And you had the press buses close behind the limousine, again, professional newsmen, eyewitnesses, they would have been there filming. Conveniently, the press has moved back at the last minute. There wouldn't have been a need for Abraham Zapruder, an amateur, to film the assassination. Another break from routine in the Dallas motorcade, the positioning of police motorcycles around the president's limousine. As with any other motorcade, the Secret Service worked hand in hand with local authorities to ensure the safety of the president. Usually surrounding the car, there would be a group of motorcycles. This was not only to obscure or block the view of potential assassins, but also to prevent anyone from the public who might be viewing who got too excited from approaching the car. And up to and including the day before the assassination, this held true. It was prior Texas stops in San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth. Normally there were six to nine motorcycle officers around the presidential limousine in a wedge formation, including flanking the car, which means in translation, they were riding right beside JFK. Then all of a sudden there is a last minute change and the motorcycles are reduced to four beside the car, but then they're not even beside the car. They're not flanking anymore. They're moved behind. Translation, the formation was meaningless. It offered no protection at all. In fact, when the shooting began, you don't even see the motorcycle officers around the car. Agent Lawson told the Warren Commission why he had ordered the motorcycles to fall back from the limousine. Well, it's my understanding he couldn't hear conversation well. That's why he didn't want the motorcycles beside him. And yet they had no problem that morning in Fort Worth, the day before in San Antonio and Houston, and four days before, the week before, the month before, the year before, the years before. They left Kennedy a sitting duck. Another line of protection for the president that wasn't used was the limousine's bubble top. The bubble top was a plexiglass covering that was put on the car, the presidential limousine. The conventional wisdom that it was bulletproof and bullet resistant. Turns out it was not bulletproof or bullet resistant in the standard way we think of that. However, it was a psychological deterrent because most people assumed it was bulletproof. Popular belief has it that the limousine's bubble top was not used for two reasons. One, because what started as an overcast and dreary day turned sunny and clear. The actual films and photos of several motorcades shows the bubble top on in the brightest weather conditions imaginable. So there's a myth that it was only on there for inclement weather. Not true. And the bottom line what the bubble top would have done is it would have obscured an assassin's view via the sun's glare. The second reason most often given as to why the bubble top had not been used is that the president had requested not to use it. But I spoke to the agent who was the driver of the follow-up car, Sam Kinney. Sam Kinney adamantly on three different occasions told me that President Kennedy had nothing to do with it. It was solely his responsibility. The bubble top came in six pieces, but sometimes it was on there for just the front and rear pieces were on. So it would be an open car and some semblance of protection as well. A partial bubble top with the front and rear pieces on, and he would be able to get air to be able to stand up and he didn't have that configuration. It's a question of why. Why wasn't at least that configuration used in Dallas? Another troubling inconsistency with Secret Service protocols was the monitoring of buildings. Buildings were not properly monitored in Dallas. Windows were not even properly monitored by the Secret Service. When Lawson said it was his usual instructions to give out these orders to scan the windows along the parade route, but he didn't remember giving out the order or not. And it turns out the Dallas police, who were also involved in security of the motorcade route, said that no orders were given. The bottom line protocol were agents or local police or both were supposed to monitor buildings. Daly Plaza was not properly cleared, was not properly monitored, and the overpasses, any potential overpasses that would have been cleared to spectators and manned by local police. Even more alarming is what happened inside the Secret Service car directly behind the president's limousine once shots rang out. Shift leader Emery Roberts would give an order to the other agents in the car. When the assassination 
begins, he orders the men not to move. Sam Kinney, the driver of the fob car, who's right beside him, confirmed to me that this happened. He ordered the men not to move at the beginning of the assassination. Jeffrey Roberts supposedly ordered the men not to move. These men were sworn to protect the president, to dive in front of a bullet if need be, to sacrifice their body. And you mean to tell me this man is going to order them to cease and desist when the shooting begins? And just what were the Secret Service agents who were actually inside the president's limousine doing at the time of the shooting? Agents Bill Greer and Roy Kellerman were pivotal to the success of the assassination. And they were pivotal to the success of the assassination through inaction. Bill Greer was the driver of the president's limousine in Dallas. Roy Kellerman was riding right beside him. Greer hits the gas pedal. Kennedy lives. First shot rings out. Bill Greer looks back at the president. His foot's on the brake, too, because the car slows down. It's only going 11.2 miles an hour. It's crawling at this point. And then Roy Kellerman says, get out of line, we've been hit. That's when Bill Greer turns around a second time and is staring at Kennedy and doesn't do anything until Kennedy is killed. Yes, it was only six to eight seconds, depending on estimates, but that is a lifetime for Secret Service agents. Count down six to eight seconds and watch the video of Reagan being shot. These men, by the time the eight second shot, they're well out of there. Let alone two, three, five seconds. Amazing what they did. And Roy Kellerman, for his part, doesn't jump. He doesn't jump back. And he's turned around. He's staring at Kennedy, too. The shooting had stopped by the time Clint Hill, who was assigned to protect the first lady, finally leapt onto the limousine. Could these monumental lapses by the Secret Service just have been a series of unfortunate oversights? How convenient that this all happened on the day allegedly a lone assassin struck the president down. 1963 protocol, President Kennedy should have lived in Dallas. He should have lived past the Dallas motorcade. But Floyd Boring in charge of protection of the president by planning the Texas trip, Emory Roberts in charge of the fall car, and Bill Greer, the driver of the president's car, those three men bear the largest burden of what went down in Dallas. The buck stops in the Secret Service. Yeah. Roy Kellerman spoke with FBI agents at the president's autopsy. He was quoted with a surprising statement. Agent Kellerman said that the security for this trip was the most stringent and thorough ever employed by the Secret Service for any trip the president ever made. Now, if you believe that, I've got some land I want to sell you. In 1995, the government's Assassination Records Review Board, wanting to compare security in Texas against other recent trips, requested to see all Secret Service documents pertaining to presidential visits around that time. Rather than comply, the Secret Service destroyed many of its records from the fall of 1963 making any true comparisons impossible.